Thanks, everybody. Um, I was just talking to one of the gentlemen here, and, and uh, it's a little strange to hear a Marine talk about an Army story, okay? So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not really that unusual, because we, it's a very incestuous relationship with the four services. We all have instructors and professors and everything like that. So uh, I grew up in Colorado. I, uh, I am, I'm from Littleton, Colorado, and I grew up skiing up here and started skiing in 1963. And uh, I never knew about the 10th Mountain Division until I came back. Uh, my last duty assignment was at NORAD Northcom. And uh, when I was at NORAD Northcom, then I got involved with skiing again. And, uh, and so I met a couple of guys, and I'm going to introduce you to them in a minute. Um, and so I, I found out about this story, and I thought, this, is, this story is so unique, it's, it needs to be developed. And so um, I, I started working on it, and, uh, and I, it, during my career from 1981 to 1992, I did what these guys did. The Marine Corps has what we call uh, the Marine Corps Mountain Warfare Training Center, and it's in Bridgeport, California. It's in the Sierras, uh, not far from Lake Tahoe. And so uh, when I was doing this, I, I started off there. I, I worked there as an instructor for three years. And then I, uh, subsequently, I went to uh, Alaska. And so I was an ins inspector instructor in Alaska for three years. And then uh, my other trips, I had five trips to Norway, always in the winter on NATO exercises. And so as I went on all of these exercises, I, I learned everything about how to do this uh, mountain warfare, uh, summer and winter, and so that's how I got started with it. And then I, when I came home, back to Colorado, um, I started working on this, and, and then I met these guys. So uh, this is the story that we're going to hit. And this gentleman in the green shirt, his name is Sandy Treat. Uh, Sandy Treat died last September. Uh, he was a, a resident of Vail, and he uh, he gave a, a similar a, a lecture uh, on Fridays at the, at the museum there. The guy in the blue jacket, that is Dick Over. He uh, was a 10th Mountain guy. He was up at Camp Hale. He was a signalman. And uh, he's standing next to the ski trooper statue there at, at uh, Camp Hale. And the ski trooper statue represents all of the guys that were in the, the 10th Mountain Division. It's not just uh, for the officers or anybody else. So our story really starts in uh, 1932 when the Olympic Games came to Lake Placid. And so when they came to Lake Placid, there was a radio announcer named Lowell Thomas. And so Lowell Thomas was on the radio and he was making the calls and he was telling everybody how exciting it was to be skiing. And the 30s was the, really the opening years of uh, skiing in America. And uh, that's kind of what it looked like in the 30s. That was pretty primitive, and, and there weren't a lot of people that participated in it. It was mainly uh, on the East Coast where it really became the, fin the most famous, and, and they, had, they began the, with the toes and the rope toes, and, and people would walk uphill and do it. So <clears throat> at those times, in the 30s, uh, it was then and now that it was the rich and beautiful that could get in their cars and drive from uh, New York or, or Connecticut, and they'd go up to Vermont and, and, uh, and New Hampshire uh, to ski. And so, uh, and out west, there was a Sun Valley started in 1936, and there was other, you know, ski areas that were starting in the 30s. Winter Park started in 1939. Um, so as the, as, they, as the ski area started to develop and places like that, then the Hollywood crowd uh, would come and, and they started to, to ski and they'd like to take lessons and things like that. And uh, you can re you might recognize some of these movie stars from the <coughs> from the 30s and 40s. And uh, there's some more of them that would come and and uh, like Gary Cooper and Claudette Colbert, uh, they would uh, frequent uh, Sun Valley and they were clients of Friedel Pfeiffer, who was an Austrian 10th Mountain guy and uh, talk about him a little bit. Um, and then there was a place called Sugar Bowl that it, it opened in 1939 or 1936. And uh, one of the chief investors was Walt Disney. 
And so Walt Disney invested in Sugar Bowl, and Sugar Bowl then became, it's a little closer to Hollywood than uh, Sun Valley. Sugar Bowl is up by Squaw Valley, okay? It's not too far from Lake Tahoe. That's, that's the area that it's at. And, and this fella here in the middle, his name is Hani Schroll, and Hani Schroll was an Austrian. He was an Austrian ski champion uh, back in the 30s. And uh, he came down to, to Sugar Bowl and he started his own ski school. And so there was, an, uh, there was two ski schools there. Uh, the Klein brothers, uh, Wilhelm and Frederick, ran a ski school there at Sugar Bowl as well. And if you've ever seen the movie when Goofy's learning to ski and you hear Goofy yodeling, that's Hani Schroll. <laughs> He's really doing the yodeling in it. So in 1933, uh, Adolf Hitler becomes the Chancellor of Germany. And now uh, when Adolf Hitler becomes the Chancellor of Germany, he starts the mobilization, the remobilization of his country. And uh, in 1936, he moves into the, the Rhineland. The Rhineland was a 30-mile strip of land adjacent to the Rhine River, but it was adjacent to France, Holland, and Luxembourg. And in the Treaty of Versailles in 1918, the Germans were prohibited from mobilizing and reoccupying the Rhineland. And Hitler thought that this was one of the biggest gambles he took during the war. But he was successful, and uh, the Allies didn't do anything about it when he <clears throat> moved back into the Rhineland. So in 1938, he decides that uh, I need more Lebensraum, more living space and he wanted to take to annex Austria. So on March the 12th of, of 1938, uh, the Germans moved into Austria, and they were welcomed by the Austrians, and they became part of the Third Reich. And then later that year, uh, that was in March, and in October that year, Adolf Hitler decided that he needed more space, and he needed to infringe into Czechoslovakia, and so that was called the Sudetenland. And the Sudetenland was a strip of land adjacent to Germany, but where the German-speaking people lived that were living in, in Czechoslovakia. So he, as he decides that he needs to take that, then the Allies did start to get concerned. And they, and, but Adolf Hitler says, no, once I have the Sudetenland, then all of my uh, territorial desires will be satisfied and I won't need to do, do anything else. And so that there was the Munich Pact was signed by uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain and Mr. Dadlier from France and they signed the pact with Hitler. But then on September the 1st of 1939 is when uh, the Germans uh, invaded uh, Poland. And when they invaded Poland, the Allies now had to react because France and, Ger and England had made a pact with Poland and they said, if you are attacked, we will come to your assistance and to your aid. So they had a treaty. And so when they were attacked, then Britain had to react to that, and in which they did. And, and so the, the Brits sent uh, men uh, over to, uh, to, to, to the continent, to France, and they were going to try to help the, help the Poles. Well, two weeks after the Germans attacked Poland, then the Russians attacked. So the Russians came in from the east and attacked into Poland. The Germans had already attacked, come in from the west, and they had uh, taken over Poland. And so the, Pol the Poles couldn't last uh, 30 days under a double onslaught from the Soviets and the Germans. So on the, that was uh, on September 1st, that's when the war started. September 1st, 1939 is the day that the, the World War II began officially. That's what uh, historians have designated as the date. So the, now the Russians were emboldened because they didn't have to work too hard when they moved into Poland. And so because of that, they decided that they would invade Finland. And so on November the 30th, of 1939, the Soviets invaded Finland. And so they invaded with about a half a million men, uh, thousands of tanks and armored personnel carriers and half tracks. But the Finns decided that they were going to fight back. Um, unlike the Poles, the, the, the Finns didn't have uh, much of an army. They didn't have ha artillery. They didn't have tanks and airplanes and everything else. But they could ski. 
and they could ski and they could uh, ski and they could ice skate across frozen rivers and they could attack the, the Germans when they came across. And we had a guy uh, named David Bradley who was a Dartmouth graduate and he was a skier and he was uh, hired by a, a newspaper and he accompanied to the Finns. And so David Bradley was sending reports back to General McNair who was the head of the Army Ground Forces and uh, General uh, Marshall. And so as Bradley would report about how these guys were doing, uh, these guys were, were able to hold their own uh, in Finland. The, the Finns were able to hold their own against the Russians. Well, the Russians, when they came with all of those vehicles, those armored vehicles, the tanks and armored personnel carriers and Amtraks and everything, they have to stay on the roads. The Finns on their skis did not have to stay on the roads. So it was what the, the tactic was, was they, the Finns would drop a number of trees across the road in a crisscross like this, and then at the front of the column and at the back of the column or the middle of the column, thus isolating all the vehicles in between, and then they would ambush them. So when the, the Soviets got out of their vehicles, then the Finns would fire on them and kill them. And then at night, the uh, Germans had to get out of those steel vehicles and they would light a bonfire so that they could keep warm and the Finns would then attack them at night also and uh, this is when the Molotov cocktail became uh, uh, popular um, so they'd light a bottle of gas on fire and throw, in it, uh, throw it into the tank and so the tanks were getting decimated here uh, on the road and the, the Finns were killing Russians at about a rate of 40 to 1 um, uh, where they were at the Finns actually destroyed two Soviet divisions and one NKVD regiment, which was like a SS regiment. So the Finns were thinking, Where, what are we going to do with all these bodies uh, that are accumulating? So they had to face that problem. So in February of 1940, now <clears throat> there was four guys. There was uh, Minnie Dole, Alexander Bright, uh, uh, Roger Langley, and Robert Livermore. Uh, Bright and Livermore were Olympic skiers on the 1936 team, and Roger Langley was the head of the National Ski Association. Minnie Dole was the head of the National Ski Patrol. Minnie Dole founded the National Ski Patrol in 1938. So this is a place called uh, Johnny Seesaw's Inn. Uh, it's at, at the foot of Bromley Mountain in, near Manchester, Vermont. And so they met in this inn, and they discussed, uh, they were reading the paper, listening to the radio, uh, and thinking, you know, the United States does not have the capability similar to what the Finns have. We do not have an army, or we do not have any capability on, in snow or on skis. And so what would we do if Hitler came across the pond and he invaded Canada? Now remember... Britain's at war now. Canada is part of the dominions of Great Britain. And if the, if the Germans came across, invaded Canada, they would come right down the Champlain Valley and then they would invade New York. And this idea was not out of the realm of possibility in 1940. So as you th think about war and you think about the successes that Hitler's having, Everything in Europe is going Hitler's way. So as these guys decide that they're going to do something about it. So what are we going to do about it? We need to write to General Marshall and General McNair, and we got to tell them we need, we need mountains. We need troops that can fight in the mountains in the cold. So then the next thing that happened, that meeting was in February. In April of 1940, uh, Hitler invades Norway. So when he invades Norway, uh, Mr. Churchill is real upset about this. So Mr. Churchill decides that he's going to send a brigade to Norway to help the, the Norwegians expel and fight the Germans. The British Navy was fairly successful at this time, but the, the army, the brigade that went to Norway, uh, they were ignominiously defeated at uh, Narvik, and they had to be evacuated. Uh, and so Mr. Churchill realized, too, that we don't have the capability to fight in the snow and the cold like the Germans. So we'd better do something about it. So now on, on May the 10th, uh, the Germans come through the Ardennes 
Uh, they surround, uh, they go through Holland. Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg, France, they're all invaded. And uh, if you've seen Dunkirk, you'll remember that the, the British expeditionary force was all forced back into the Dunkirk area. And uh, they had to be evacuated by the home fleet from Great Britain to come over and take those men away. 300,000 men were evacuated. <coughs> Uh, 200,000 Brits and 100,000 Frenchmen were taken off the beaches at Dunkirk, but they couldn't bring their gear. They had all of their vehicles, all of their howitzers, all of their weapons and everything else had to be left in France. So now these guys all had to be rearmed and retrained and, and built back up again. Um, so now Hitler's partner in crime is Benito Mussolini. And Mussolini... Uh, realizes that there is going to be a restructuring of Europe. And what's going to happen in Europe is uh, all going to be driven by Hitler's aims and what Hitler's conquests are going to do. And he feels like he is going to be left out and Italy's going to be left out. So Mussolini decides that he's going to uh, attack his old enemy, the Greeks. So that the Greeks between Italy and Greece is the Balkans, right? Uh, Kosovo and, sorry, and all of that. So you have to go through the mountains. So, he tell, so in October of 1940, he says to Hitler, Mein Führer, we are on the march. And this infuriates Hitler because he's not ready to get into something else. He, Hitler wants to call the shots about what, who's going to be invaded and when they're going to be invaded and why they're going to be invaded in, in order to do what. So Mussolini goes, and then, but the weather comes in. And so now these guys are getting, they're dying of exposure and, fr and frostbite. And they have 10,000 Italians died of exposure uh, and an additional 25,000 battle deaths. It was, <coughs> it was a huge defeat of the Italians there in the Balkans. And then Hitler has to divert his forces to go save these guys. And Hitler realizes that Italian leadership is wretched, he says. Well, we've got a guy, a Lieutenant Colonel L.S. Giraud. And L.S. Giraud, it was like David Bradley, but he's a, a liaison officer there, and he's watching this, and he sees this. He's with the Greeks, and he's writing back to General McNair and General Marshall. And so he's a lieutenant colonel, L.S. Giraud is, and he's telling them um, these casualties from cold weather are substantial. And if it looks like we're going to get into this war, we're going to have to get some guys trained in how to fight in cold weather. And how are we going to fight in the mountains? And how are we going to fight in the snow? So we've been, we've been getting these letters from Minnie Dole and I'm wondering what we're going to do about it. So they do their analysis and they f figure out that it, Germany in 1940 has three mountain divisions. By the end of the war, they've got 14 mountain divisions. The United States has none. Um, so what are we going to do about it? These guys are good. You know, they've got Austrians and Germans from Bavaria and from the, and then they lived in the mountains. They've been climbing mountains and skiing all of their life. And if we're going to fight in the mountains, we need to know what we're doing and we need to have some kind of capability to meet that. Well, this is the guy, this is Minnie Dole and he's the father of the 10th and he's writing these letters, almost a thousand letters that he's writing to General Marshall and General McNair and he's writing it to the uh, head of uh, the War Department, um, Mr. Stimson. And so as he's trying to convince them that we need to have men that are trained to fight in cold weather in the winter and, and we need to, to start now uh, before we're actually in the war um, because everybody believes that we're in the war. But Mr. Roosevelt, there was too many isolationists that prevented us from trying to gear up and say, we're going to get in the war. FDR was saying, I'm not going to get in the war. Um, so, so Minnie Dole now, he's taking the lead on this and he's going he's gonna to pester them until they relent 
and uh, realize that we've got to have this capability. So he keeps writing to FDR and General Marshall, this is General Marshall, uh, <coughs> he became the Chief of Staff of the Army on September 1st, 1939, the day World War II started is when he, he gets assigned the, the, his big assignment. Um, so Minnie Dole says, okay, if you guys aren't going to do this, and I think that we're going to be invaded, or we might be invaded, I'm going to ask the National Ski Patrol if, they're gonna, if they would voluntarily patrol the upper tier of the United States, and they can ski, and they can do patrolling uh, against the border of Canada to see if, uh, if we are invaded, what could be done about it. So, and then he also asks them, if the Army is willing to undergo training, would you guys be willing to provide the training for them? So there's about 90 ski patrols in the country at this time. And what the ski patrols did, what their job was, is they would provide uh, sleds and safety for ski races for the amateurs. And so that's what the ski patrollers did. Um, let me back up. Minnie Dole in 1938 was, was skiing in New England. He broke his ankle and uh, he had no way to get down. So his friends that were with him found a piece of corrugated tin on an old barn roof, tore it off. He sat on it and they pulled him down and he had to ride the train back to Connecticut with a broken ankle. And, and he said, it not, with not so much as an aspirin. <laughs> and so, so he decides that, and he's gonna start up uh, with Roger Langley, he's gonna start the National Ski Patrol. And so he does in 1938 and then he starts it in all of these ski areas around the country and so he's the one that really started the, the National Ski Patrol in 1938. So these guys said yeah we're going to volunteer to help them. Um, so then the first year uh, was uh, the winter of 1940 the General Marshall and General McNair go out and they, they went to six different divisions and they said if you've got volunteers that would like to be trained in cold weather this winter will provide a location for you guys to, to train. So they had five different locations. Uh, there was uh, Plattsburgh Barracks and Old Forge, New York. There was uh, Fort McCoy, Wisconsin, Camp McCoy, Wisconsin, and uh, Fort Snelling, Minnesota. And then there was Mount Rainier. And there was two divisions on the West Coast in California. And they both, they, the volunteers from those ski patrols, those early patrols, skied at uh, Mount Rainier. So that was the first winter that the actual uh, skiing was done by the Army under, under, uh, under instruction. At the end of that winter, the, the reports came in, and it was all really positive. So the Army decides, all right, we're going to stand up the 1st Battalion of the Mountain Infantry, that we're going to call it. And it's going to be called the 1st Battalion of the 87th Mountain Infantry and it's going to be out at Fort Lewis. And so when they, they put the message out that we're going to start them up and it was going to be on 1 November of, sorry, 15 November of, of 1941. So that's when the, the birth certificate of the ski troops is as of that date. Um, so now when, the, when guys start hearing about it, they start the ski troops. Yeah, I want to be in the ski troops. So it was an all-volunteer outfit. So if you wanted to go in, then you could volunteer. Then 22 days later, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And so now we're going to be at war. Uh, Congress declares war two days later. And so now, now the, the recruiting effort really begins. And so there's guys all over the United States, every, you know, every young man out there uh, that's 18 or and to 29 or 30, was uh, coming down to volunteer to, to, to go in. And uh, because with the war now beginning, that the, you could be drafted or you could join the outfit that you wanted to join. So if you could get into the Air Corps or you could get into the Navy or you could get into one of those other outfits, um, then that was the time um, before you got drafted. So the Army goes to uh, Mini Dole. He says, all right, Dole. You've been uh, talking about you want to start up this outfit of skiers, and you've been telling us we needed this capability. So 
We've got one battalion now that we're, we're working on that we stood up, the 1st Battalion, the 87th, but I'm going to need to fill out a whole regiment. So I need 2,500 more guys in, uh, in 60 days. So he so many dull says, all right, I'll get you the men, but you got to let me do it my way. And he says, because we're not just going to take anybody to get into the ski troops. So you're, everybody's going to have to fill out an application. And with that application, they have to get three letters of recommendation. And they can come from a coach or a teacher or a priest or a, an employer or whoever. Um, and all of those applications got to come into me, into my office in New York. And they said, okay, okay, Dole, you, do, you, you can have it, you can do it your way. And he says, so I'm going to need some help in recruiting. So he said, you got a guy named John Jay. And that's John Jay, um, right, oh, right there. <coughs> this is him, and that's him. And what John Jay, he is a direct descendant of the first Supreme Court Justice, okay? That's his family. So what he had done in his young life uh, he graduated from Williams College, and he made ski movies. So he would go around uh, and showing his ski movies. And he made a ski movie called uh, Ski Here. He made two about going skiing down in South America. And it was Ski Here, Senor, and Ski the Americas, North and South. So those were the first two movies he had, and uh, he was a ski filmmaker. And so... Uh, Dole says, I need John Jay to help me with this recruiting effort. And so he, he said, okay. He said, you can use Jay. And so what they did was Jay would go around to theaters and, and show these movies. And then, but Jay said, now I have a friend, and she's not going to get drafted, but she wants to contribute to the war effort. So her name's Debbie Bankart. And so why don't we get Debbie to go around to all of these colleges where they have ski teams and to every place in the country and we'll show the ski movies and we'll have Debbie pass out the applications to get the three uh, and get the three letters of recommendation. So that's what Debbie did. And so Debbie signed up. She was a family friend of the Jays. And so Debbie and, and this girl was the first certified female ski instructor in America. And she, was a, she ran a ski school at Oak Hill uh, near Bromley, near, near Dartmouth, um, uh, Han near Hanover. And so Debbie, all of 42, all of 43, and, all of, and half of 44, Debbie was going around the country showing ski movies and getting young men to join uh, the ski troops. And so that was how Minnie Dole was going to do it. And so that's, that's how it started off uh, with those two uh, as the main recruiters. And then John Jay was, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Minnie Dole was uh, buying uh, ads in magazines and newspapers and, and uh, stuff like that. So the first, <clears throat> the first year, the winner of uh, 41, um, uh, would, they, they took the Army, said, all right, where are we going to send all these guys to train them? Well, let's go out to, to Mount Rainier. So there's two lodges out at Mount Rainier, the Paradise and the Tatouche Lodge. So they rent these two lodges, and that's the barrackses for these guys. So the, that first battalion goes out there, and they start training, and they, they learn how to, uh, to, to move cross-country. And they had to, to, to get out of this idea of just downhill racing. Because there was a lot of guys that were skiers from the Eastern Colleges. Yale, Dartmouth, uh, Cornell, um, Princeton, Penn State, Penn. Uh, any place back east that had a ski team. And these guys were, they, they could all ski. And so they, uh, they all joined up. And they are, they, but now that you're out there at Mount Rainier, you're going to have to ski cross country. And you're going to have to carry a pack and a rifle. You're going to have to sleep out in the snow. You're going to have to make food out in the snow. You're going to have to be able to keep yourself warm. You have to keep yourself from getting frostbite. So that was how the initial training went out there at Mount Rainier. Uh, and so that first, the first battalion of those guys 
Um, and keep in mind, these were almost all volunteers. But they weren't drafted yet. And there were guys in the Army that could ski, and you could get transferred over into the 1st Battalion of the 87th. And, and then you're going to build it up. So as, the, at that, as that first winter went by, um, the Army decides, all right, this is going pretty good. We're going to need a lot more than a battalion. We're going to need more than a regiment. We're going to need a division. So if we're going to need a division, where are we going to put it? So at this time, the boss, the, the head guy was a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Onslow Rolf. And Onslow Rolf was a, a graduate of uh, West Point, And he graduated the same year as Mark Clark uh, in 1917. And so what, what, what Onslow Rolf did, or they, they told him, we've got the, the Corps of Engineers is going out. And we're looking for a place for we can build in a, a cantonment area camp for a, a division of mountain soldiers. So we think we found one out here in Eagle Valley, Colorado, um, Eagle Park, Colorado. So I want you to go out and take a look at it. So he says, okay, I'll go out and take a look at it. So he goes out and take a look at it, and he says, okay, this is, yep, this is a great place. He goes out there in February, and it's like now. I mean, there's a ton of snow, <laughs> and there's, uh, you know, so there, there's everything else. So if we were going to build this big camp for a division of guys, <clears throat> a division then is about 12,000, between 12,000 and 14,000 guys. So it's got to be close to a railroad. So we can carry stuff up there on the railroad, and we can offload it close to the camp. It's got to be close to a hard surface road. It's got to have plenty of snow in the winter, and it's got to be close to, to rocks where they can do rock training, rock climbing, uh, skill, skills for mountain skills for the summer to, uh, as well. So they decide on, it's real close to Pando, Pando, Colorado. Now Pando, was a whistle, it was a, it was formed to, by the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad to be an ice station. And it served as an ice station from 1903 to 1935. And then because they would, they made these p ice ponds and then the ice would freeze, they'd saw it up, they'd put it into these concrete uh, buildings up there to keep it for the, for the summer because there was a lot of produce. Then they needed ice to go to Grand Junction and all over, right? So, and those three concrete buildings are still there. Uh, if you go there, you see these enormous, great big concrete buildings um, that are there. All right, so that's Pando. So this is where we're going to build a camp. We're going to be close to Canada, Pando anyway. So for this crowd, I don't think I need to show you where it is, but Copper Mountain is right here. And you come, this is I-70. And so you come down I-70, you go down uh, 19 I, I, to, to Leadville, and then from Leadville you take 24 up, and this is where Camp Hale is. Now if you keep going, you'll go to Minturn, and you go back to I-70. Okay, so you, now you know where, where the camp is. Um, so they start building the camp in April of 1942, and they're going to work on it through November of 42. And uh, what happens to the guys the, the, the soldiers, they're out at Fort Lewis. Fort Lewis is 45 miles away from Mount Rainier. So when springtime comes, you can't stay at Papatouche and Paradise Lodge anymore, so you had to go back to, to Fort Lewis. So they're kind of waiting. Now they start building, and so they send a lot of those guys, and they send them out to Fort Carson, Colorado, Colorado Springs. So they're in Fort Carson. They're, they're, trying, they're still starting to build up the rest of the 87th Regiment. And while these guys, the, con the contractor firms, come and they start building uh, Camp Hale. So they're going to work on it from April to November. And there was thousands of contractors, builders. And so uh, it's going to be named after this guy. He's a Colorado boy. Um, <laughs> he went to East High School, graduated in 1977. Um, if you know Denver, you know East High School. Uh, it's still there. Um, he had a brilliant uh, record at West Point, real high grade point average. He was, uh, he was with Teddy Roosevelt at San Juan Hill when he uh, went up. So that's who we're going to name the camp after, perfect guy. The Corps of Engineers comes out to Eagle Park and they straighten out the Eagle River 
and they straighten it out and it goes right through the camp. It's as straight as a string today as it was when they built it in 1942. So they built over 800 buildings out there. Um, it was about $31 million in uh, 1942, which would be $31 billion today. It's about the same as building a football stadium. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so they build 800 buildings, and there's, there's all kinds of buildings. And that's kind of what it looked like. There was uh, three theaters, three PXs. Um, there was... Uh, there was a hospital. There was, there was even a, uh, a, about 200 German uh, prisoners of war that were out there. Uh, they, had, uh, they had housing for uh, civilian personnel, for like plumbers, electricians, and teachers, and you know, all that kind of stuff. And they had about 3,000 mules. So like this part of the camp is human population. These are soldiers down here and from here back is mules. And so they had veterinarians and they had uh, all and everybody had to learn uh, to take care of the mules. So yeah, everybody went to mule school. And so it depend not, it, it didn't matter how good a skier you were or how, uh, how rich your family was, you had to go to mule school. And so you had to learn to water the mules, curry the mules, feed the mules, ruck out the stalls, and everything else, uh, because that was just part of it, part of, part of being there. So Minnie Dole decided uh, it's harder to get skiers to join this outfit because we don't have that many skiers in the United States. So we're going to have to change the application process so that we can get guys like lumberjacks and cowboys and, and forest rangers and blacksmiths and all other kinds of guys that can help us, that can fight and, and handle the cold weather and live in rough. <clears throat> so one of the cowboys that joined was uh, Jim Like, and he was a champion, and he was, a, he was really getting to be good as a champion rodeo guy when he went into the Army. Uh, this is Paul Petzl. Uh, he was part of the, he was a climber. His, he ran the climbing school at Yosemite. Uh, he later in life uh, started the, NOL, the National Outdoor Leadership School. Uh, but when he was 18, he was part of the American team that climbed K2. But somebody got sick on that climb, and he didn't make it all the way to the top. But K2 is harder to climb than Mount Everest, and so because of the technical parts of it. Um, so he came down, but he was known as the highest man in America. Uh, Peter Gabriel was from Switzerland. He was a big guide over in Switzerland, and he guided all through the Alps and the, the Himalayas and Alaska even. Um, he came into the tent, and this guy was uh, the best skier in the world at the time, um, Walter Prager. He, was, uh, he had won the Kandahar in uh, 1931 and 1933. Uh, in 1934, he was a world champion and a downhiller. And then Walter, uh, after he had all those championships, he came to America and he was the coach of the Dartmouth ski team. And so the years that, that Walter was the coach of the Dartmouth ski team, the Dartmouth ski team never lost. And uh, he, was, he was regarded, everybody regarded him as the, the best skier in the world. Um, these two guys, both Austrians, Tony Matt and Lugi Foger. Uh, Tony was an Austrian champion. Uh, Austrian downhill champion and slalom champion. Lugi Foger was an Austrian ski jumper, but he also ran a ski school. And then a lot of these guys were, j just went on to great fame and fortune. Uh, that's Friedel Pfeiffer. He's the guy that started uh, Aspen. Um, there's John Jay again. After the war, he went on to keep, in, he continued making ski movies. This is Steve Knowlton. He was an Olympian on the 1950 team, <coughs> team. and he, he moved to Aspen. He uh, just always considered himself Aspen's first ski bum. Um, he, he started a nightclub there called the Golden Horn, and he ran it for years and years. Um, this is Larry Jump. Uh, he, would, he had quite a background of skiing and climbing before the war, but that's the guy that started Arapahoe Basin. Um, and then there's Pete, Pete Seibert. He's the one that came back after the war, and he founded Vail. Um, so th that was some of the guys that were going in at the time. You know, Pete was only 18 when he went in. Togar Torkel 
held the, the world uh, record for a ski jump. Um, he was the ski jumping champion. He, he, he came to, uh, he set the record in, uh, in Michigan, Iron Mountain, Michigan. And I think it was 289 feet that he uh, jumped when he held the, 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 the world record. And uh, he was the most liked guy, liked guy, and he was the most famous guy in the tenth um, because of his world record and just his effervescent personality and how charming he was and everybody, everybody just loved him. Um, okay, so 1943 comes along and this red line, this red dotted line, that is the furthest extent of the Japanese conquests, uh, okay? That is called the great, that was, everything within that line is uh, the Greater East Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, is what that's called. And there was two islands, uh, uh, Attu and, and Kiska. And the Japanese had come over and they had, they had landed and they, they had taken those two islands and this, these were, this was, Alaska was an America, American territory, but this was American territory that, that the, the Japanese had captured. And General Marshall and General McNair said, we, they can't do this, we can't stand for this. We gotta send troops out there to add to, to evict them. So uh, in 1943, in May, in the spring of 43, uh, they sent the 7th Division out there. There was a big, huge fight out on Attu. Um, there was about 375 guys, uh, Americans, who were killed in that big fight out on Attu. And at this time, was, the war was still pretty young, pretty new in the war. And uh, the Japanese weren't going to surrender. They did a big bonsai charge at the end of it. Americans killed them all. Okay, but we lost about 375 guys. And so there was still, after, after Attu was, was taken back by the Americans, then the, there was still the island of Kiska. So we still had to go out to Kiska. So General Marshall decides, uh, why don't we send those cold weather guys that we got? And by this time now, see, after, after Camp Hale finished its completion, it was finished enough by the November of 42 that they took those guys out of Colorado Springs now and they moved them into, Fort, uh, into Camp Hale. So they're up at Camp Hale, they're, it's summer, so, but they said, all right, you guys, 87th, we're gonna send you out to take uh, uh, Island of Kiska. So they get on a train, they go out to Fort Ord, they get some amphibious training, they get, you know, they get trained, and so they're gonna take that regiment and it's gonna be part of a big task force that's going to go out to the Island of Kiska and evict the Japanese. So then, it was called Operation Cottage in August of 1943, 34,000 guys. And uh, the 87th was just part of that task force. Uh, but their, their mission is that they're gonna go ashore, they're gonna climb up to the top of the hills, and they're gonna hold the hills while the rest of the infantry troops uh, come in behind them. And uh, they, they don't know exactly how many people are going to, how many Japanese are going to be on that island, but that's the size of the task force um, that goes out there to uh, to retake Kiska, uh, 34,000 guys, and there's, they thought that there was only about 2,000 Japanese on that island. Um, so when they land on Kiska, uh, they go ashore at, at night. Uh, it's very foggy, um, but there's no there's no Japanese down by the shore. And so they, they go in and they in the 87th, those guys start climbing up to the, get to the, to the top of the mountain. Um, and the mountain, the, the top of it, it's like a big U, okay? And so there was some guys on this side and there were some guys on the other side and it's very foggy and it's nighttime. So you, you look across and you, it, and you think you see a Japanese soldier, or you think you see the enemy, and so they start firing. And so they keep firing, and they, um, they fire each other, and it's an intramural firefight. And so there's 23 guys killed that we killed each other. And so the 87th, um, there was uh, 23 guys that were killed there, 
And as they stopped the firing, and then as the morning came, and then they started looking around the, all over the island, there were no Japanese on the island. And so the Japanese had evacuated the island a month earlier. And so uh, the, the 10th, or those guys from the 87th Regiment, they were stuck out on Kiska till about December, till they could go. So, but there were some guys who were killed by uh, booby traps. Um, the <coughs> Japanese left a lot of booby traps around. And uh, as the GIs were going through the, the different locations of the Japanese encampment, they would open a door and a, a grenade would be behind it or something. And so anyway, 23 guys were killed out on Kiska. So they're out there till December, and then they start coming home, and uh, they, they have to be back at Camp Hale by a certain time in January. So, but they, they only leave Kiska in drips and drabs, depending on the shipping, because all those ships that you saw that took them out there, they're all gone. They're, they've gone back down to the South Pacific to, to be fighting. So they get, these, they get ships, they get back to LA or San Francisco, and then they got to make their way back on a train to get back to Camp Hill. And you can see the, the, the smoke coming out of those trains, um, those different trains every day going up there, and all those 800 buildings, that are, they're all burning coal to, to keep those buildings warm. And so there's always a fog of s haze and smoke in the air coming from all that burnt coal. And all those guys get this, not all, but many get a, a bronchial uh, infection and they, they were ha coughing and hacking. It was called a pando hack. And so they, they, <coughs> they had to put up with that while they were there in the camp. But, and in the summertime, you didn't have to worry about that too much because you didn't need that, that, that warmth or that, that cold burning uh, stuff going on in the summertime. So you could get out to the field and you do rock climbing training walk training and rope training and you, you have to know your knots. You do stream crossings and all kinds of things like that. So here's a battalion out in the field uh, near the rocks where they're going to be, where they're doing that. And you take guys out there a battalion at a time and then company by company they go through their different uh, exercises and through their paces. There was a few guys that went back to Mount Rainier and uh, they did some glacier work but that was very small. But it was all about skiing. Skiing was really what it was all about. And there was two divisions of guys. Uh, they came from the 33rd Division and the 31st Division, and they were from Louisiana and Tennessee. So the Army decided we're not going to need these two divisions. Let's close these two divisions out and we'll take those guys. We'll send them out to Camp Hale and we'll teach them to ski and we'll and those guys will be trained to fight in cold weather. And those guys, for the most part, were not happy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they, ca <laughs> they called their skis torture boards. <laughs> and so, and they would, uh, they would break them up and burn them and, you know, they would gripe about it all the time. So <laughs> here's a group of guys learning a kick turn uh, by the numbers. Um, and then on most days that you would have a, a squad and you'd have a guy, the, the squad leader and the instructor has that white piece of tape on his sleeve and that was the only indicator that the guy was a, uh, that, that he was the ski instructor. So then you could get out to the field and you go on an exercise and you go out there to bivouac and you'd camp out for a week and you'd be out there and then they'd have to bring you the food and stuff like that. And they'd bring you the food and they'd bring you uh, a tent and stuff like that with the mules. And the mules were hauling a lot of that gear out there to the, to the field. And this is uh, kind of what they look like. And uh, most of the, the mules belonged to the artillery um, because they had to haul, haul those cannons and all those mortars and stuff like that. And here's a young trooper with his mule. And uh, every artilleryman had his own mule. And so he would take him, and there's part of a, a part of a 75 pack howitzer on the back of that mule, and that's what a mule uh, looks like. That's an artillery mule that's fully packed with all the stuff you need to put for for a 75 millimeter pack howitzer on. So and they also did some uh, experimental work with over snow vehicles. And they were learning to to, to use this stuff. Um, 
these two guys here trying to ski or um, and that's pretty poor form probably um, but these guys did a better job they're skiing behind a weasel uh, okay mr. Churchill wanted a weasel after the, the debacle in Narvik in Norway so he wanted an over snow truck that he said he wanted and so Studebaker said all right we'll make you uh, we'll make one so they got so Studebaker company got the contract to make a weasel um, they made three different variants before they they got to the T29 was the latest it was the last variant that went to Italy with them um, and here's some guy ski oaring and it's a lot easier to ski or going uphill than it is going downhill so <laughs> these guys look kind of look like they know what they're doing they tried dogs for a while that didn't work took too many soldiers to take care of the dogs and uh, it was just too time consuming and if you don't have a weasel and you don't have a mule and uh, you have to revert to manpower and you can see these guys are carrying their packs and they're pulling that rope to pull that toboggan up the hill and you can see the wind is up and uh, that's when it's really fun out there um, being out the wind like that and sometimes you had to make a path so that the mule could go in it because if the if snow comes up to a mule's knees uh, he won't go and if he if it comes up to it touches his belly then he just lays down and he won't get up so then when that happens you have to take all the gear off of the mule <laughs> then you have the men have to pack it and then so you pack it a path so the mule will go through it and you see this mule doesn't isn't carrying anything <laughs> so they've already they've already uh, they're packing the pack the, the, the way for them, for them and the ladies came in 1943 uh, the ladies came out there about 200 uh, women the wax came out and they uh, were there uh, when the guys got back from Kiska so when they came back from Kiska they got to uh, their morale all went up <laughs> and the ladies got all kinds of jobs uh, you know they were clerical they worked at the hospital they worked in the motor pool they drove trucks they drove everything uh, they 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 did all, all all manner of jobs that you could do out there um, and they were very much appreciated uh, so Minnie Dole kept uh, advertising and that's Walter Prager on the cover of Life magazine there um, oh and the movies the Warner Brothers came out there so they, there's two movies that supposedly that were made out there uh, the first one was called Mountain Fighters and it's in Technicolor and it's about a 21 minute long movie um, you can find it on YouTube uh, but you, you can't go buy it um, because Warner Brothers has the copyright on it and so you can't find it anywhere to, to, to buy a copy of it uh, but it's it's a it's it's pure 1942 or 1943 and it's pure propaganda um, but it's pretty pretty cool and uh, the other movie they made was uh, I Love a Soldier uh, and it was uh, terrible <laughs> so it's a black and white movie and there's hardly anything about Camp Hale in it there's about six seconds of a, a shot of Camp Hale with snow on it and, that, and, that, and there's, no, there's no other relationship to the movie and this nut Sonny Tufts was in it and yeah, forget it um, so when you're out there regardless of the winter you're gonna have to, to go train you're gonna have to go to the rifle range you're gonna have to go to the grenade range you go to the bayonet range you're gonna have to do all of that stuff uh, to, to train they had a couple of ra indoor ranges for with a 22 that they could uh, do their marksmanship training with but this is the rifle range and uh, there's a hundred targets down there and I'll show you what it looks like today there's still there's the, the the range itself is still there and so what are you doing when you're out there at Fort Apache you know you're you're 15 miles from Leadville but you're a hundred miles from Denver and so uh, what are these guys thinking about you know they're like every other soldier in the world um, at that American soldier in the world um, and then there was this place that in Leadville that was 15 miles away and this place is still there it looks just like it um, today and this was uh, 1879 this is where Doc Holliday shot his last man 
was in that, in that bar. So when we go out there for uh, Memorial Day or anything like that, we always end up there at the Silver Dollar. Um, but that's one of the places they went. And sometimes Leadville was off limits <laughs> because uh, the Leadville, Leadville had minors and prostitutes. And so there was either fights or guys were getting venereal diseases. So uh, before you could go out, you, you always had to get the uh, safety brief before you go out on Fernal on Friday night. Um, so you could usually, then and now, you could usually go out after 4.30 p.m. on Friday afternoon. You didn't have to be back till formation Monday morning. And so the, the base commander would give the safety brief and he'd get everybody into the field house and he said, all right, gents, if you engage with those prostitutes out there, they will get, give you venereal disease. So abstain from that. Don't do that. Stay away from that. He leaves. Sergeant Major comes up and he says, gents, I don't want to say something against what the colonel just told you. He says, but those prostitutes, they will not give you ven venereal disease, but they'll sell it to you. <laughs> One of their favorite places to go is to Aspen, and then is the Jerome Hotel. Um, it's on the National Landmark, still there. It's a very swanky place now. But this is where they went, and, and they would come across uh, from Camp Hale, and they would stay there, and they could stay overnight, and they could get a dinner and a breakfast for a real, like a buck and a half. And so all of these guys loved it. And so uh, personal story is this guy right here. His name is Eben Joy. And so one day I was skiing at Arapahoe Basin, and I had my helmet on, and I had my 10th Mountain sticker on my helmet. And the guy comes up and he says, you in the 10th Mountain? I said, no, I'm not in the 10th Mountain. I wasn't in the 10th Mountain. I just know about 10th Mountain. He goes, my dad was in the 10th Mountain. And he says, you know that picture of those guys standing in front of that, in front of the Jerome, and that guy standing there with a beer? He said, that's my dad. <laughs> yeah, it was a true story. And uh, so all these guys, there's actually six guys that were there today, and the guy taking the picture, that's his car. And so, so these guys were uh, all good skiers. Um, somewhere I've got all their names written down, but I can't remember all of them right now. But anyway, that's the old Jerome Still there, still a beautiful place, lovely place to go. And then when they went to Denver, they would like to go to the Brown Palace. So when they went down to the Brown Palace, um, Steve Knowlton said that this is our unofficial weekend headquarters is when we went down there. And when Steve Knowlton came back from Kiska, it was uh, New Year's Eve. And it was uh, just turning from 43 to 44. And so Steve Knowlton and two other guys they got a room on the top floor, and uh, at the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve, they, they tied the ropes off at the top of the balcony, and then they repelled down into the, <laughs> down into the uh, lobby. And Knowlton said, we were met by the unwelcoming committee. <laughs> and he said, we told them we wouldn't do it again. Um, so that was Steve. And then in, in, uh, and then in, in March and April of 44, uh, they had what was called the D series. And that stands for the division series. It's a test. And it's a because General McNair required every division that was going to go overseas to be tested before they went to ensure that they could accomplish their mission. So it was called the Div division series. And when it went, it, it was supposed to go for six weeks, but, but it only went for a little over three. Um, in the end of February, uh, well, it went from March 24th to April 15th, and uh, it was, when it started off, it was freezing, freezing cold, um, 32 below, and, they, and the whole, all 14,000 guys went to the field, mm -hmm. and uh, they had a new commander then named Lloyd Jones, and uh, he said, everybody's going to the field, everybody, and, you, and if you come back and you're sick or whatever, you can't go in the barracks, you're going to have to stay in a tent, and, because I want everybody out there. So everybody goes. Um, last, uh, and they, they, they passed, they passed the test, uh, but they, they hated Jones. Um, Jones was the CG at the time, the commanding general at the time, and uh, 
So then they come back in in April, May comes along. You're just getting ready to start uh, training for summer and getting the ropes out and getting things ready to go. And everybody's beginning to think, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? And then on D-Day, on June the 6th, uh, the Allies land, and they leave England and they go into France. And so now they're really thinking, what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to us? Here we are. We're, we're a division now. We're at uh, 12,000 guys. We've got three full regiments, three full b battalions of artillery. We've got all the attachments and everything else. What's going to happen to us? And they don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, they really begin to wonder, uh, and then they get their orders. And they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to send you guys from Camp Hale down to Camp Swift, Texas. And they're thinking, what the hell are we going to do in Texas? And so they get down there. Uh, they leave in, in June. They get down there, and the only uniforms they have are their wool uniforms. Uh, and so, so they get off the train, and you know they're sweating, and they got to carry their sea bag and their pack and their rifle and, they, and their helmet. And they had to go over to their to the barracks where they're going to be. And guys are falling out because uh, of the heat stroke and heat. Uh, it's terrible. <laughs> so, so they're going to be there at Camp Swift for six months. Uh, so what are we going to do at Camp Swift? Now, they, now they're really worried because they think that they're going to be broken up uh, by battalion by battalion or company by company, and they're going to be used as replacements. So they think that they're going to be, be going piecemeal. They don't think that they're going to be going as a division. But they get more training down there at Camp Swift, and it was training that you couldn't get at Camp Hale. At Camp Hale... There were no artillery ranges, for example. And it also at Camp Swift, they're going to get a little over 2,000 more guys. They're going to get heavy weapons. They're going to get the 81 mortars. They're going to get the 50 cow weapons, uh, machine guns. Um, each battalion is going to get a fourth company now. Uh, so as I, they see all of this buildup happening, they're beginning to understand they're not going to send us piecemeal. They're not going to break us up as replacements. So. Uh, they also get this guy, and this guy's going to be the new commanding general, George P. Hayes. And he's a Medal of Honor recipient from World War I. And uh, he's the one that's going to take him to Italy, and he's the one that's going to uh, enjoy uh, the, the training and be the recipient of all of the Elan that has already been developed in the ski troops. And so Hayes is going to love them, and they're going to love him. So uh, the first uh, battalion that's going to go overseas, uh, jo George Hayes takes over on Thanksgiving Day of 1944. And he, when he comes, and he, and he tells them, uh, you're going to have to send your wives home, go home on furlough, tell your families that you are going to war, and uh, you are getting a combat assignment, but I can't tell you where you're going yet. And I will tell you that once you're underway where we're going. Um, so the first uh, regiment to go is the 86th Regiment. Um, so the 86th uh, gets their orders and they're going to go to Camp Patrick Henry, uh, which is up by Norfolk, Virginia. And that's where they're going to go get on the ship. So the, the 86th leaves and they, they go up to Camp Patrick Henry and they go. And they're going to go work for this guy, uh, Mark Clark. He's the, at the time when they leave, He's got the 5th Army in Italy, and he's in charge of the 5th Army. And he was one of the early advocates for uh, to standing up mountain troops. That uh, When he was a young lieutenant colonel before he became a general, he was one of the guys that said, we need these. So they get on the ship. They get underway. They end up in Naples. Uh, this is what Naples Harbor looked like. There were sunken ships and turned over ships everywhere. The city was a shambles. All the people living in Naples were living in shambles. The little kids were urchins with hardly, I mean, ragged clothes and shoes and everything. It was very, very, very poor. And so for these guys, these guys, most of these guys had never been outside the United States. Most of these guys had never been on a ship before, um, let alone an airplane. So when they get there, they, they see all of this and, and they just, they feel sorry for them all. And who do they see when they get off the dock? They, they're walking down the ship. Is Debbie Bankart. Yeah. Debbie uh, 
had, uh, when they went to Texas, she goes to Minnie Dole and says, I want to join the Red Cross. Will you give me a recommendation? He gives her a recommendation. So she, when they go to Camp Swift, Debbie goes to Italy. And uh, she's there and she's handing out cigarettes and donuts and coffee and gum when they get off the ship. And uh, that's her. And then she's, she gets there in October. And she's there from October 44 to October 45. Um, she meets her future husband uh, at, right as the war ends. And then she marries a captain. Um, so what are we going to do? All right. We go from Naples. Naples is pretty far south, way down here. So they get on a train, and so they have to be taken by trucks and everything else. And they go up to near Pisa, and then one, the one group goes on a ship, and they get off at a, at a port called Livorno. And then they're, they're billeted there right, right outside of Pisa. They're going to go into the line. This is called the Gothic Line in the Apennine Mountains of Italy. Um, and the, the blue is allied forces, all right? So as I go through this, the 92nd Division was an all-black division, okay? They had white officers and black troops. Task Force 45 is who the 10th is going to replace. Task Force 45 was a bunch of uh, anti-aircraft gunners, but you didn't need anti-aircraft now because we'd already driven the Luftwaffe from the sky. This is the Brazilian Expeditionary Force, and then all of these three are under 4th Corps. This is General Crittenberger. This is 2 Corps under General Keyes. And he's got the 6th South African Armored. Then he's got three American divisions, the 88th, the 34th, and the 85th. And then the red is the Germans. These Germans, and this is a, an Italian division over here. So this is the Apennine Mountains on the Gothic Line. And this is where we're going to go in. Okay, so we, we go in, the 86 gets there in late December, they, they arrive, uh, they get to Naples on the 23rd of December of 44. Then they get up into the line <coughs> in January of, of 45. Excuse me. If any of you guys got any questions, ask it while we're here instead of trying to save the question to the last, okay? So, because I'll, I can go to any depth you want here. <laughs> All right, so, so here we are, we're in, the, we're in the fight, we're facing the Germans, and uh, General Lucian Truscott has now been promoted to be the head of the Fifth Army. And he, st and he comes to General, he says, Hayes, come on up here to the CP, I'm going to tell you what you're going to do. And so he says, um, there's a series of mountains here. And in, us, in order for the Allies to go north, there's two highways, Highway 64 and Highway 65. We've got to be able to control these two highways so that we can move north. At this time, the Germans control all the high ground, all that terrain over the, overlooking those highways, and we can't move up those highways. We can't push the Germans out of Italy until we have those two highways. So we have to take <coughs> the high ground so that we can control the highways. So he says, okay. So he says, all right, where you're, well, you're going to go, you're going to have to take this, this set of hills here, and then we're going to move on so that we can, we can uh, advance. All right, now, so here's the tactical situation, all right? The Allies have tried to take this mountain three times. Every, every time they've taken it, the Germans have counterattacked and pushed them off of it. So what General Hayes decides is, the reason they couldn't hold it is because the Germans had this mountain and they would put artillery on the, the backside of the Allies when they took the mountain. So in order to keep the artillery, the German artillery, off of our attack, we have to take this mountain first. And this is Reaver Ridge. And this is, this is where they really made their money. This is the, where the whole reputation of the 10th Mountain Division comes from, is the night that they take Reaver Ridge. So what Hayes is going to do, he's going to take one battalion, and that's the first battalion of the 86th, and they're going to climb up four different routes with five, company, five infantry companies, and they're going to take Reaver Ridge. They're going to do that, and they're going to climb that at night, 
<clears throat> and get up there, meet the Germans on the morning of the 19th of April, uh, sorry, uh, February. And then the night of the 19th of February, the rest of the division is going to attack and take Mount Belvedere, Mount Gorgolescu, and then move out. Now this ridge is about three miles long. This ridge is about seven miles long. And there's a number of hills back here on this side here. So this guy's name is Lieutenant Colonel Hank Hampton, and that's his battalion, and he's going to climb it up here. And at the far end down here is Piazzo de Campiano, and that's a First Lieutenant Jim Luce, and his platoon is going to take that, and that's where the crux of the battle really takes place, is down here uh, by, by Luce. And then the rest of the battalion takes this ridge, and then that, that night, the night of the 19th, is when this big fight's in. So there's going to be one battalion here. There's going to be six battalions here. There's one battalion in, res in reserve, and the other part of, uh, of another two-thirds of a battalion is down here ready to reinforce River Ridge. Okay, so they're going to attack it in the morning, and what Hayes tells them is that when we leave on the evening of the 19th, your weapons have to be unloaded because I don't want a repeat of Kiska, and because I don't want anybody firing at night, and the Germans are going to see that muzzle flash, and then they'll bring the artillery down on you and everything else. So the six battalions then are going to attack here, and they're going to go. So that's what happens. They attack it, and they take it. Um, and who's going to take it? Who's going to take these mountains? You know, it's these guys. It's me. I got, I got my three letters. I'm ready for this. I can do this. So that's them. And that's what they look like. That's what we look like when we were young and strong and beautiful. <laughs> now, now we're just beautiful. <laughs> and this guy up here with his tongue sticking out, I'll show you him in a minute. Um, so that was them. That's what they look like. That's Reaver Ridge. That's, that's Reaver Ridge that, that that 1st Battalion of the 86th is going to have to climb at night with gear, carrying weapons and bullets. And, yes, sir? What's the vertical they have to do? This is about 3,000 feet, okay? It's a little less than that, about 28, but the highest mountain there is Mount uh, uh, Busso, uh, and, so, and that's like 3,800. That's the tallest, but they weren't going to the top. They're only going to climb, you know, going up these couloirs in those five, those five routes. So, but at night, with a full pack, uh, it's pr still pretty rough. So the night of the, the morning of the 19th, uh, they've held the ridge. They, they get up there. The attack starts at about 6.30 in the morning when the sun starts coming up. The Germans start to realize that there's Americans up here. They didn't think that anybody could climb that piece of ground uh, at night. So they're completely taken by surprise, and uh, they're kicked off the mountain. So uh, uh, the, the, that fight lasts a couple days to hold that because the Germans are counterattacking. So from about the 20th to about the 23rd or 24th, they're, they're holding, fighting, and uh, Togar Torkel gets killed up there at that time. So the, the world champion ski jumper gets killed. So this is the top of Mount Belvedere, and you can see that there's, there's no trees on that now. It, I mean then, but now it's all full of trees. It's all great big healthy trees up there now. But this is what the road looks like. This is what Italy looks like. And so after, the, after the, they, they, they're successfully, they've taken their ground on the, on, the, on the 20th when they take Mount Belvedere. Then they go as far as they can. They get, take Mount Gorgolescu and Mount Torciata, and then they have to hold up. So they have to hold up. That, that was phase one. Now they've got to get more ammo. They've got to get more child. They've got to get more... Go, more replacements and things like that. So then they start up again on the 3rd of March to go down towards the, the end of that seven mile stretch to Mount Dallas Bay. <clears throat> the 3rd of March is when Pete Seibert gets, healed, gets hit. Um, he doesn't get killed, but he gets hit pretty bad. Um, so this is what it looks like when you could get to a road that you can use. And you, these are uh, tanks and tank destroyers that they're walking up and 
um, as they go by. And you can see that these guys aren't carrying packs. Their packs are on the trucks in, in the rear. So now we're, we're pushing north, and we got to go from, uh, I mean, we got off the boat here about around Pisa. Here's Florence, and then we're going to go across the Po, and this is Lake Garda. So this is where we go, and then Brenner Pass is up here so they can get into Austria. So the Germans are going to, that's what their, their retreat plan is going to be. So we've got to get up there to the Po, um, taking casualties, uh, evacuating people. All right, so we get to the, uh, after, after we've taken our objectives down to Dallas Bay, then Eisenhower has taken Mark Clark's Air Force, and he's using it to cross the Rhine. So now they have to hold up. So they can't leave again from the 6th of March to the 15th of April. They're stuck in one place. And so, so what, what, what uh, Truscott does is he sends guys back to Florence and Rome and Montecatini and other places where they can have furloughs and they can relax. So on the 15th of April is when they're going to take off again, is when they're going to start the big push. It's called, but it was called the Operation Cottage then. And so... Uh, this guy was one of the replacements. Um, the 15th of April of 1945 is the deadliest day in the history of the 10th Mountain Division. That's the day that most of the guys in the 10th were killed, was the 15th of April. And that's when he gets hit. Uh, he gets hit, and he's in the hospital for three years um, after, after, he gets, after he gets blown up there above uh, Castaldiano. Uh, so this young guy is the only Medal of Honor recipient of the 10th. Uh, he gets killed on the 15th also. Um, he was, did a lot of, yes ma'am. You said Bob Dole, is that Senator Bob Dole from Kansas? Yes ma'am. Uh, the very man. From our Kansas City. Yep. So uh, this guy, uh, he gets killed uh, right after he did a, he killed a whole bunch of Germans, grabbed a German machine gun, killed a bunch of them, and, and he was running around collecting uh, uh, morning reports, and he gets hit by a, a mortar shell, kills him. So they get up to the Po River, <coughs> and and he uh, and we got to get across the Po River. So what General Hayes has done is he's brought up some uh, Amtrak's. I mean uh, ducks. These are du that's a duck. It's a truck that can float and get across the river. And they brought up 50 uh, paddle boats, rowboats. And they started across the river in these rowboats, and then the ducks get up there, uh, and then he gets across the river, and then he's going to keep going north. Uh, and General Truscott comes up to Hayes, and he said, "George, uh, don't you, don't get across the river. I don't have any way to support you if you get across the river." And Hayes says to Truscott, "Oh, do you want me to bring him back?" And he says, "No, don't bring him back. Just get, get up there and establish a good beachhead." And so he says, okay, we'll do that. So he gets across the river, and now the Germans have crossed the river too because they're being decimated because our Air Force is killing them right and left, burning them. The Germans couldn't move in the daytime. Um, if, they, if they did move in the daytime, they were getting hit by, by uh, our Air Forces. So the Germans are running as fast as they can north, and we're chasing them as fast as we can north. And then so we're walking we're humping um, these guys are wearing their packs now they got to take their gear because Hayes is going to leave his artillery so he can just use his trucks so he's going to move uh, as many as he can as fast as he can and he's going north he talks to Truscott he says let me get up to Lake Garda I'll go on the east side of the of the lake uh, and I'll get around them before they can get to Brenner Pass so what, when they get up to Lake Garda they uh, find that uh, Mussolini has been set up his fascist headquarters there in a town called Gargano, and it's on the west side of the lake, and that's where he is, is held up. And so the 85th sends a company of guys across the lake to uh, take that castle. Mussolini has already fled. He's already been captured by the partisans, taken to Milan and killed. Um, and so his body's hanging up and all of that. But they get that place. Now it's near the end of the war. Okay, so he gets there on the thirty on the 29th of April. Uh, the guy that goes across the lake is a is a young lieutenant named uh, uh, Gene Hames. Um, 
And so Hames gets, gets across with this company. And previously, before they, they started all this, General Hayes told them, um, he, what General, one of the things that General Hayes told his troopers was that you're going to have good times and you're going to have bad times. And I, my policy is to have as good a time as we can. And he says, and I want you to have a good time because you might not ever get back this way again. And I want you to, any time that you can, and you want to collect your souvenirs and send them home to your family and share them with your grandchildren, he says, you take as many souvenirs as you want. And so it was open, open house. So when Gene Hames and his company gets here to Mussolini's castle, they go through the castle and they could take anything they wanted. And so, so they did. And uh, Gene talked about that. About, and, and if you go to the, the, the Vale Museum and you go back into the room there where the little theater is, you'll see there, there's a big glass box and it's got Gene's souvenirs that he brought. And there's Gene's ID card in, in that little glass thing. So if you ever go to the museum in Vale, uh, I encourage you to go there and see that. Um, so that's, Gar that's Gargano, that's the Villa Fetorelli. Uh, where he lived. Now, this is the guy that started the Rangers, William O. Darby, o o L. Darbo. Um, after uh, the capture of Sicily, um, his, a bunch of Rangers were captured and killed, and it, and it really devastated Darby. And they sent him home back to the Pentagon for about a year, um, and then he was coming out to Italy on a, on a visit, and <clears throat> he comes up to, Italy, up to, to hey, where Hayes is at in Wetruscot, and uh, he came out with Hap Arnold. And, uh, and so at that, that particular moment, um, the assistant division commander was a guy named Robbie Duff, and Robbie Duff had been badly wounded, and so Darby asked if he could take the job as the assistant division commander. He had known, he, he had known Hayes before. And so Hayes says, yeah, you, you can stay and be the ADC, the assistant division commander. And so he says, okay, so, so what Duff was doing, he was crossing the Po River and he had a task force. So now they put Darby in charge of the task force. <coughs> it's called Task Force Darby. And he goes up to, to the north end of Lake, Gar Lake Garda called, to a village called Torbola. Now when he's in this village and, and they're... He, they go in with the other hierarchy of the 86 about what, what the plan is for continuing to push north. Um, they come out after lunch, and a, and a German 88 shell hits the side of the restaurant, and it, it, it comes down, and it hits Darby and the 86 sergeant major named Tim Evans. And so Darby is killed on the 30th of uh, April of 1945. And... The other notable character that was killed on the 30th of April, 1945, was Adolf Hitler. So that's how close you were to the end of the war, and uh, Darby gets killed. Then on May the 2nd, the, the Nazis surrender in Germany, and uh, then the guys are all relieved. Uh, General Hayes has to go up to the north end of the lake, and he has to collect the German commander, uh, General von Singer. And General von Singer, that's General von Singer, he was, a, uh, he was not a Nazi. He was a uh, Catholic, a strict Catholic and a, and a Rhodes Scholar. And he could uh, speak perfect English. And so he retired, or so he, he uh, surrendered. And then, and then General Hayes took him down to Florence near to Mark Clark, where he formally surrendered all the Germans in, in Italy. Um, so this was Castaldiano. Uh, Bob Dole is hit not far from here. And so now that the war's over, uh, all of the Italian people start coming out from wherever they were hiding, and they start to go back to their homes and things like that, or what was their homes. And so everybody's pretty happy now, and you see all of the, the young women that are out and seeing the soldiers. And then the, the uh, Italians are showing the soldiers where they've been hiding all their wine from the yeah. Germans. <laughs> And, uh, and, they're, and, they're, and even the Germans are showing the GIs where the, the Germans were hiding their booze, too, because <laughs> they, they were finding these boxes of booze, and it was, says, marked, for, uh, reserved for the Wehrmacht. And so they were, they find all of this stuff, and then they were passing it around. And uh, General, General Hayes said, 
I want every soldier in this division to get two bottles of champagne, and I want every officer to get a bottle of cognac. <laughs> and so <laughs> this guy is the father of a, a guy named Flint Whitlock, and Flint Whitlock's a writer, and he's one of the descendants, lives in Denver. And, uh, and so that's his dad. And so everybody was very, very happy here at the very end of the war. <laughs> and uh, they, so they could take off and they could do, you know, do back, go back to what they were doing. Now, so with nothing else to do, they decided, well, we might as well have a ski race. So they, <laughs> <laughs> so they have the, they have a, a year before they had had a ski race at, uh, at Camp Hill. And it was called the first annual military ski race. And it was put, set up by a guy named Ralph Bromigan. And Bromigan was one of the writers of most of the songs. And everybody loved Bromigan. Bromigan had been killed. So they set up this ski race. And, uh, and who do you think won it? The greatest skier in the world, Walter Prager, <laughs> first sergeant. So these guys, uh, they get on the boat and they come home. Yeah, they, they had to go to... Uh, near, over near Trieste for a, 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 a three, two or three weeks to keep Tito from a coming infringing into Italy and he had to stay over there on his side of the river. Um, so they came over uh, and they came back. There was about 975 guys killed in Italy, uh, 23 guys killed on Kiska. Uh, it was real close to a thousand, the guys that died of wounds later. Uh, and this is the cemetery it's not too far from Florence. And so they, uh, they also started climbing schools again while they were over there. They had a few pretty successful uh, alumni. Um, Frank Sargent was the governor of Massachusetts. Bob Dole ran for president in 1996, and he was the president of the Senate. And he had a real good political career. David Brower uh, ran the Sierra Club for 25 years. Uh, ben Duke ran uh, Gates Rubber Company for uh, 25 years. Merrill Hastings is the guy that started Ski Magazine. Bill Bowerman, uh, he was the Olympic track coach in 1972, but him and Phil Knight founded Nike Shoes uh, up in Seattle. Um, there was over 62 ski areas started with 10th Mountain veterans, or 10th Mountain veterans were involved in it, uh, whether they were ski patrol or they were instructors or mountain management or they built, they built lifts. Um, <clears throat> then all of these places had 10th Mountain guys that uh, worked there and uh, had something to do with building the ski industry in, uh, in Colorado, anyway. Um, they, Fritz Benedict started the mountain hut system uh, where you can go backcountry and stay in one of the huts. 36 uh, 10th Mountain huts in Colorado around Aspen Vale, around. Um, and Pete Seibert thought that they kick-started the ski industry by about 10 years. He said the ski industry would have got there anyway, but he said they wouldn't have got there as fast without the 10th Mountain guys. So that's the highway leading back to it. That's what Camp Hale looks like today. It's nothing's there. Um, so these, this is where the supply sheds were, where, where Tober Torkel could jump up onto, the, up onto the supply counter wearing a pack and take a standing, just stand in front of it and jump up on it. Um, that's the back of the rifle range. And all of these little, <coughs> it looks like a little cave. That's where you put the targets. Uh, you, the, the targets stay in there and then there was a, you would bring the targets out and they put in a stanchion and it would go up and down and then the guys at the other end would fire into it and, and they would mark their targets and that's how you get qualified out there at the range. That's what it looks like right now. Um, this was the field house. And it's all destroyed. Uh, and this is where they'd have their dances. And they'd have, you know, the, the first dance was in February of uh, 43. They only remember, they only got there in November of 42. So that, and they trucked in girls from Alamosa and uh, all over southern Colorado to, to bring them over there so, they'd, so the soldiers would have girls to dance with. Um, and the only place they do mule packing now is my old place, the Mountain Warfare Training Center in Bridgeport, California. And we got about 25 mules and five horses and two donkeys. Uh, uh. And this is the memorial on Tennessee Pass. Um, and there's Memorial Day up on uh, Tennessee Pass every year. We have a general from 10th Mountain comes out and he gives a speech. And then we have a big feed up at the lodge. And then we have a big ceremony down at the, at the cenotaph. 
This was taken a couple years ago. Um, this is the guy that had his tongue sticking out up in that one picture. So old Pete's gone, Earl's gone, uh, Clark's gone, Bob's gone. Dick is the guy in, in the blue jacket at the beginning by the statue. And George is gone, and Bob's still here. So that was 14, and then now this was, this was 18, and he's gone, he's gone, uh, Perry Smith's here, Sandy's gone, and Neil's gone. So they're going fast. Uh, the youngest of them is, well, just turning 96. Um, and this is what they look like, young, young and strong and beautiful. This is the guy that took Mussolini's castle. It was this guy, Gene Hames. Um, now this, this is, I don't know if you can tell this or not, this is Pete Seibert right here. <laughs> that's the, the guy that's the founder of Vail. Uh, um, that's Pete. The last time I gave this was at Vail, so I, I didn't take these pictures back out of it. And there he is. <clears throat> that's the guy that founded it, that founded the 10th Mountain Division, Mini Dole. Wouldn't have it without him. And that's the cenotaph there at the at the uh, at Tennessee Pass with the uh, thousand names on it, and every place it went. And folks, that's semper avanti. That means always forward. So um, I have uh, I've co-written two books. Um, they're for sale. If you'd like one of these books uh, or both these books, I sell them for fifteen bucks a piece, or to both of them for twenty-five. And I tell this story. And the first one uh, has the is a love story in it with the with the, the girl, with Debbie. But we had to change her name because Debbie's daughter wouldn't let me use her mother's real name because she thought I'd put her in a hot tub or something. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she didn't let me do that. So uh, that's the story of the 10th, and I'm pretty much on time. Yes, sir? I had a question. If I remember last time, there, did you mention they were thinking of making another movie about the 10th? I'm thinking about movie. Uh, yeah, I've, yeah, I've got a producer okay. uh, who's looking to make the script based on the books. Um, so what we want to make is a 10-part miniseries okay. like Band of Brothers and like The Pacific. <coughs> So that's the goal here. So uh, if you want to see what it's about, you know, I'll be glad to sell you my books that right across the, in, the, in the schoolhouse. Okay. So yes, sir. What kind of training do they do at Fort Drum now? Cold weather. Yeah. But they don't have mountains. They don't ski. No, 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 no mountain training. Yeah, they, they do cold weather, but they, they, it, it's a brigade. It's not a division. It's called a light division. And so they, but they deploy a lot. They use helicopters and they do army, typical army flatland training. But it gets damn cold at uh, Fort Drum. I mean, I've been there and spent a night in a tent and it was 40 below. Yes, sir. <coughs> is the Tenth Mountain using your expertise to train and to tell the new soldiers about their story? It, I tell everybody, anybody. Um, I've been out to Fort Carson and I've given the class, this class, to them. Um, they're, they're, I'm always willing to talk to anybody, and so they they listen. And I have some friends that are, you know, Army guys. And uh, they've listened to it and all of that, but I'm willing to go and tell them anyway. But when they, you know, this is their grandfathers, okay? So when you when you talk to a young group of guys, they're okay, okay, okay. We got this marine up here. What's he talking about? You know. And so, but having this group, the age of this group is my most receptive groups. <laughs> so, and I do this at museums and libraries, and I do it at, uh, uh, you know, I, I did it to USAA. Um, I did it to all kinds of different groups. I did it to the Mercedes Car Club. Um, I've done it to, you know, anybody that wants it, you know, I'm happy to give it. I've given it up at Vail, uh, at the museum there. I've given it to climbing shops. I've given it, I, I give it about twice a month, all, all the time. 
like I said, this is the fifth time I've done it in, in this room. So. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for being interested. Thank, thank, thanks, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming.